Okay, we'd ask folks to take your seat, please. And um, I'd like to point out that there are some excellent posters on display uh, outside in the, in the gallery area. Uh, please take time to uh, see them. Uh, Dr. Kerry Schulze uh, gathered faculty and students and collaborators to uh, submit posters and, uh, so that we could have a display of, of uh, the kinds of things going on here that don't necessarily get highlighted during uh, the presentation. So we have a great lineup this afternoon. Uh, don't go anywhere. I uh, hope you're rested, you've drunk your tea, your coffee. We're going to lead off with Professor Robert Black. Bob, you'll notice that the rat appeared. I don't know how it happened. <laughs> but he's really cute. Uh, so we have uh, Professor Robert Black, uh, who is our Department of International Health Chair for a very short period of time, only 27 years, uh, during which the department uh, grew from four faculty to over, uh, well over 100 faculty, uh, and has worked uh, tirelessly on trying to pull the world's data together. Uh, about what we know about these kinds of problems. So, Professor. Thank you, Keith. Um, it, it, first, if I had known that Al was going to start off with uh, what uh, the nutrition community got right and got wrong, and if I realized that uh, McCollum's rat was looking at me from his peripheral vision, um, I, I would have put in a couple slides, but I will tell a, a small story before I get into uh, the, the Lancet series and the findings related to vitamins and minerals. Um, you know, it wasn't only vitamins that the McCollum lab was working on, it was actually minerals as well, and they were looking up into the 1930s for essential elements that uh, were important in nutrition, and they started working on zinc, and I, I have worked on zinc, although that's not largely the focus of my talk today. And the first paper by that laboratory, by a graduate student and E.V. McCollum, said zinc is not an essential nutrient, it, you know, it's, it's ubiquitous, it's... Uh, you know, it's really not something that would uh, be necessary to consider in the diet because it's in all the diets. And really what happened is they, they were trying to use deficient diets, but they didn't have a sufficiently deficient diet or environment, including the cages, and they, they really didn't create zinc deficiency. And there were subsequent publications, and then they did actually get it right and published that, that zinc was essential, not the first publication on it. But So it is, it is this story. But there's another part to the story also that early on, it was thought that it was only severe zinc deficiency that was a cause of, uh, of ill health or perhaps mortality. And until very recently, the last couple of decades, uh, that was really the, the presumption. But it was really through epidemiology and through trials that it was uh, recognized that even milder forms of uh, what you might call subclinical, without overt clinical manifestations of zinc deficiency, did result in serious uh, consequences for infectious disease particularly. So that's my little digression about, about zinc. I couldn't resist. Um, so we, uh, in 2008, published a series of papers on maternal and child uh, nutrition in the journal The Lancet. And just this year, uh, this summer, did an update, a five-year update of that series. Um, in this um, uh, set of publications, four papers, and a call to action comment. And I'm, I'm not going to go through the details of the uh, of the papers, I'm going to really focus just on some of the aspects related to vitamins and minerals and what we said um, as part of the overall conclusion. So it may be a little bit uh, disjointed in the sense that it doesn't have the, the total um, uh, set of information that we were we were working with. But I, I will say we, uh, just for the sake of the framing of the entire series, we were looking in this. Uh, in this set of papers at the consequences across the life course. So, so in this case, reshaping this framework that, that was d developed a long time back by UNICEF as a framework for undernutrition or for stunting. We turned that around to say we wanted a framework for, uh, for actions to achieve optimal fetal and child nutrition and development. So it's much more encompassing. But it, it includes then the consequences, which I'm going to talk about briefly, uh, then the nutrition-specific interventions, so the kinds of things that 
um, you would think of as, as obvious examples to improve nutrition, supplements, fortification, improve diet, breastfeeding, et cetera. And, that, and those interventions work at, at this level, the more, more approximate level um, of determinants of the, um, the optimal fetal growth and, and nutrition. And, um, but we also, in this, in this series, looked at these, um, these other sectors and programs, for example, in agriculture, social protection, social safety nets, uh, education, uh, water and sanitation. So the, the other aspects that also have relationships to nutrition, looked at the evidence, to what extent did they, did they affect uh, maternal and child nutrition? And then finally, at this uh, most uh, underlying level of determinants of, uh, of the context in countries, we actually looked at how uh, to build an enabling environment to improve nutrition. So there's, just to say, there's much more involved in, in this series than the little bits I will show you. Uh, Klaus already showed this table, and I, I don't want to dwell on it. I, I will say, though, that even at a global level, uh, there is very substantial uh, deficiency remaining of these four um, important micronutrients, vitamin A. And, and I, I think important to, to recognize here is compiling the data on um, the population deficiency. There is still high prevalence of it in spite of the fact that there is um, a very substantial effort going on to deliver high dose vitamin A supplements. And those supplements have, as I think Al alluded to, were presented as far as the attributed uh, deaths that uh, have likely been averted by the supplementation programs. We may, may through the programs, have, have reduced the mortality burden. Certainly, it looks like there is a reduction of the eye disease, the xerophthalmia. But we have not corrected the underlying dietary deficiencies. So without the supplement programs, those, um, those conditions, uh, ill health conditions, will likely return. So it is to say that, um, that there is a, a need to persist in the programs. Um, a new estimates um, done around the time before for the series actually on iodine deficiency. So a lot of issues around what it means uh, to uh, to have urinary iodine in school children below this threshold. Uh, nonetheless, uh, in certain areas of the world, it is likely there are still uh, consequences of this. Um, the milder degrees of iodine deficiency, especially in areas such as, uh, as, as Europe, which doesn't really, uh, many countries don't have iodized salt, uh, it's still debated how much effect that has. Perhaps there is some, as recently published in, from um, England, on cognitive uh, impairment. Um, zinc deficiency, we, we used um, a dietary assessment and the estimates here, and it varies uh, the prevalence of uh, likely zinc deficient diets uh, varies by region, but overall about 17%. And then some new estimates that we did for, for the series on the importance of uh, iron deficiency anemia, both in children and in pregnant women. So moderately high prevalences um, across all the regions, actually in both these, these uh, age groups. So some conclusions um, related to some particular vitamins and minerals. One is that we redid some analyses related to anemia as a risk factor for maternal deaths. Um, most likely, the deaths that are associated are those due to hemorrhage. Um, so when a woman starts anemic, she may have higher risk of death. Um, the, um, the hemorrhage is the leading cause of maternal deaths. And our, um, our estimate is that about a quarter of those deaths um, you might attribute to, or at least there's a strong risk relationship with anemia. Likewise, uh, calcium deficiency increases the risk of preeclampsia, and preeclampsia and eclampsia are currently the second leading cause of maternal deaths, so about 19% of those deaths. So we, th we have said, and I think it's clear from the evidence, that addressing these deficiencies would have benefits for maternal health. Uh, for micronutrient deficiencies in children, um, you saw earlier the, the entire range of uh, micronutrients. We didn't deal with all of those in this series. We really focused on the ones with, with the most demonstrated um, health effects. And the first statement is uh, very clear that, that uh, deficiencies of vitamin A and zinc adversely affect child health and survival, and I'll show the attributed deaths in a moment. And the deficiencies of uh, iodine and iron primarily um, are uh, 
are risk factors for or contributors to um, the children not reaching full developmental potential, so cognitive impairment. And as I already mentioned, and Al did as well, continuing to address the vitamin A deficiency um, would uh, would be necessary. And what I'm showing is the is the um, the health consequences of vitamin A deficiency at this point of the marginal benefit of now um, the reaching additional children who are not being reached by vitamin A supplements so that the numbers is much less because of the programs that do exist. So this is the overall table that we, we published in the, in the series. And I, I don't have time to go into all of these, but I would highlight that we, um, we, in the new analyses, gave a lot more weight to fetal growth restriction as, as assessed by small for gestational age. So maternal nutrition, undernutrition, as, as one factor contributing to poor fetal growth and development. And then um, being born small for gestational age, we're attributing um, about 800,000 deaths to that condition. Um, not prematurity, I'm not talking about low birth weight the, the under 2,500 grams, I'm talking about specifically being small for gestational age. Uh, so it, it really puts us um, back to put a, a major focus on pregnancy and as we've said, perhaps the uh, preconception period or adolescent period where nutrition needs to be considered to, um, to improve the health of, of girls and women but also to improve fetal growth. Um, other estimates here for uh, for stunting, uh, uh, underweight, et cetera. Um, the, the zinc deficiency and vitamin A deficiency sees here. This is the attributed deaths at this point in children under five, uh, although not the entire age group for each. And um, and then overall, and this is a figure you may have heard. When we do the uh, use the methods that allow us to combine these, not simply add them, but look at the uh, at the uh, joint distributions and the and not double counting, we come out with about 45% uh, of all uh, child deaths attributed to undernutrition um, in in one form or another, including suboptimal breastfeeding. Um, and so this summarizes that 45%, as I've said, that's about 3 million deaths a year out of the uh, almost 7 million deaths. And um, deficiencies of vitamin A and zinc account for about 300,000 of those currently. Um, we looked at interventions in the second paper of the series, the nutrition-specific interventions. And this is uh, the uh, plot of how many uh, deaths would be averted by scale up to 90% uh, coverage of those interventions. Uh, a very large number from treatment of severe acute malnutrition with uh, mostly community-based uh, interventions to uh, provide uh, ready-to-use therapeutic foods, but also um, preventive zinc supplementation uh, and preventive vitamin A supplementation down, down here, but again, at at the time when programs for supplementation are already um, very extensive for vitamin A and virtually no programs for zinc supplementation. Um, let me go on quickly. We, we looked at the effective packages of interventions. As you can see, uh, micronutrients play an important part in, in most of these. Uh, we're, I'm going to show data in a moment on maternal multiple micronutrient supplements. Uh, but also calcium uh, supplementation to mothers at risk of low intake, uh, salt iodization as another important uh, and now uh, uh, widely used uh, intervention. Um, critical importance, as we pointed out in the 2008 series to the, uh, the time in pregnancy, but also the first two years of life, the thousand days uh, critical period for interventions, both for breastfeeding and complementary feeding. And then for micronutrient supplementation as another package that we looked at vitamin A and zinc, and then the treatment of uh, severe and moderate malnutrition. So I'll just show here the effect of these packages, and this is the number of, of lives saved from implementing the packages. And then interestingly, we did a full costing um, of the scale up of these interventions. And I think by, by any measure, this cost per life saved is, uh, th these are, are very cost effective or very low cost per life saved compared to many other interventions. And in fact, all of these are, uh, are uh, highly, cost-effective. Um, 
I said I would show a little information on the multiple micronutrients in pregnancy because we, we wanted to look particularly at the effect on small for gestational age. So as I said, we now you know, have evidence of more importance to the fetal growth restriction. And that importance actually is not only for mortality, I should also add, I didn't put it in a slide, but Perul Christian here did some very nice analyses related to the effect of being small for gestational age on stunting and uh, uh, the, the attribution of about 20% of global stunting to fetal growth. Uh, so stunting at 24 months of age, but actually in some parts of the world, India that has 47% of all births being small for gestational age, the attribution of, uh, of uh, SGA or fetal growth restriction to stunting is more like 35%. So a fair amount of regional variation. But so what do we do about it? So what interventions do we have that can affect being small for gestational age and reduce the risk of it? Well, one is multiple micronutrients in pregnancy. These trials are, are in comparison to iron and folic acid, which of course is the recommended, currently recommended uh, supplement during pregnancy. And these, these trials actually, in this standard uh, forest plot of all the trials, show an overall effect here, um, and I'll just go on to, uh, to this one, which you can see more easily. Uh, so there is an effect on, on low birth weight, but importantly, we were trying to distinguish between the effect on, on uh, being small for gestational age or, or preterm. And there's not the same studies in each of these analyses, but, but I think from, um, from that previous uh, meta-analysis plot, you can see that um, there is a 11% reduction in being small for gestational age uh, with the use of multiple micronutrients, even in comparison to just iron and folic acid. And there's also um, a small but statistically significant reduction in the risk of preterm births. And preterm birth uh, complications of preterm birth by our estimates we do with WHO is now the second leading cause of death in the world. So even a small percent reduction can be a very major um, benefit for survival. Now, I'm cheating a little bit because Keith wanted me to put in a little bit of what we have done on uh, zinc supplementation for young uh, children with acute diarrhea. We didn't deal with this in the Lancet series. We've dealt with it in lots of other publications. And in fact, in another series of papers we published early this, uh, this year on diarrhea and pneumonia in the Lancet. So it is part of a Lancet series, just not the nutrition series, um, but it, um, it actually is this is the beginning of the story for me at least. This is our this is the first publication on the use of zinc supplements in young children for the treatment of diarrhea. A study we did in India. Um, Sunil was my Sunil Sazawa was my doctoral student at the time. What we showed in this RCT was a 23% reduction in diarrhea duration. There, there are other effects I don't have time to go into, but just for interest, I wanted to show this because it's it comes from a recent analysis we've done. And it just shows, in a way, how much is out there that we may not know, um, and how and the power of the electronic searches. Uh, so we did the trial, published it in the New England Journal um, back 20 years ago. There have been another 14 trials um, that I'm calling here the, the non-Chinese trials. So what we knew about the world literature until earlier this year, and what basically the the recommendation was based on for use of zinc were these trials. And they basically, they essentially confirm what we, we showed in the first study, a reduction by 22% uh, uh, in, the, in the duration. There are various measures of that, but uh, the episodes lasting um, more than three days or more than seven days. But then we actually learned through some colleagues, or through collaboration in China, that there were a number of trials done in China in the last, mostly in the last five years. We thought, okay, we'll find a few more trials and we'll put them in the meta-analysis. And there are now electronic databases of Chinese uh, published studies. And fortunately, not that I speak Chinese, but we have faculty, we have students, and we have collaborators in China who, who can read these papers and can do the literature searches. To my astonishment, we ended up with 89 trials done in China, all of zinc uh, comparative trials, randomized controlled trials. They were, none of them were placebo controlled. They, uh, I guess, decided not to use placebos, couldn't find placebos, but they were, they, they were generally methodologically sound. And the interesting thing is, 
with these trials, they find the same thing. <laughs> and um, th there's actually a, um, a whole set of these trials that was done very specifically in rotavirus diarrhea. So all these trials were, were just general. We didn't know the etiology. These, uh, this set of trials here I call episodes. They were just um, general etiology. But a, a sizable number, 29 trials were done specifically in rotavirus diarrhea. So the rotavirus diarrhea, as you may know, is the most severe, most likely fatal cause of diarrhea in the world. So remarkable evidence that confirms uh, very much what, you know, what the, the other global literature has shown. And the, Global um, treatment policy by WHO and UNICEF was set in 2004, and it does recommend um, the zinc supplementation during diarrhea to shorten the duration and, this, and reduce the severity. So I'm finishing with this. Uh, the conclusion is that for pregnant women, providing multiple micronutrient supplements has uh, benefits on maternal health and and uh, and mortality and improved fetal growth and reduction of, uh, of preterm births. Um, we also talk about the need for more research, really, on the preconception and uh, adolescent care uh, issues and uh, to know how much uh, we can improve uh, nutrition and, and ultimately fetal growth as well. Uh, for, for children, this series re-emphasizes re and reaffirms the, the uh, statement that we, can, we really should be focusing uh, very strongly on the thousand days from uh, conception to the second birthday, and this includes for the importance of, uh, of these micronutrients. Of course, it's not the only period for vitamin A uh, or zinc, for that matter, but it's a period of, uh, of great importance for growth, and uh, it's also a very high mortality period. And then, as I said, zinc for treatment of diarrhea is another aspect that uh, that is part of the recommendation. Scale-up has been slow, but it's picking up in, in a number of countries now. I'll end with that. Thank you. I think uh, we have lots of grist for the mill. Uh, we'll have a hopefully a vigorous uh, discussion. Uh, we've reserved time at the end of uh, the day for an open dialogue. So hold your questions if uh, if we haven't been able to accommodate them right now. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit, uh, and uh, Dr. Harry Dawson is going to. Uh, address this issue of, well, okay, micronutrients have a variety of effects, looks like they reduce infection, so forth. How? You know, what are the mechanisms? Uh, Dr. Dawson uh, is a uh, nutritional immunologist working in genomics. Uh, he's at the uh, Genomics and Immunology Laboratory at the USDA in Beltsville. He's on the faculty of the Department of International Health uh, and uh, thinks about mechanisms you know, all the time. So, uh, Harry, please come on up and, and uh, address this sort of facet of this, uh, of this diamond. Well, I'll say that just to start off, Keith had said to me, I've got about 14 minutes and 50 seconds to give you the how of this uh, equation here. Um, so I'm going to be uh, broad, uh, not necessarily deep. Uh, I've got a couple of, of slides that we've made for a recent uh, workshop that was convened last November by the Bond Project, looking at the needs for uh, the research in nutrition and immunology. Uh, so, so for something this big, where do you start at? Uh, there are so many nutrients, there are so many parts of the immune response that have been shown to be responsive to nutrition. Uh, I think Dr. Ames had mentioned 40 essential nutrients. If you consider 2,500 or so food components that may qualify as bioactives, uh, it's really a daunting task. There are thousands and thousands of articles. So where do you start at? Well, you start in the very beginning. So I don't know this literature as well as I should, and certainly as well as some of the people in this room, but if you go back to the original papers, uh, Wolbach and Howe, they describe some defects in what are, are the, is the immune system of, of the rat. Uh, a chemically insensitive non-secretory epithelium, uh, 
basically a spleen that was devoid of lymphoid cells and a missing thymus. So I could probably say, well, that explains it all. I think Dr. Summer had said what they knew back then. We could stop there and say, that's great, because now we know we have impaired innate immunity, barrier function, and we have impaired cellular or adaptive immunity, and we don't need to do anything past 1925. Well, there are some indications back then in debate in the literature whether, in fact, that rat model uh, was actually reflective of human deficiency. You know, do you see children with no thymus gland that are vitamin A deficient? And I would submit to you now, even to this day, I think, and this is my own ax to grind, the over-reliance on rodent models has set, you know, there have been some very important findings in those models, but when you go looking for things that you find in the rodent and try to find them in the human, you don't necessarily find the same thing. So let me just orient you to this slide. This is one of four slides that we originally prepared for a course that uh, Dr. Coles and I teach here at, at the school. And it was to give the students essentially a summary of zeitgeist, some the feeling of, of what micronutrients do relative to each other and also relative to different mechanisms that may or may not have been established. So along the side here, we have basic indicators of innate immunity. We have a qualitative, not a quantitative score about whether or not the mechanism has been well established. And let me just explain what our inclusion criteria is. There has to be good evidence that there is in fact a deficiency established. And there has to be some sort of evidence, either at the cellular level or at least a tissue level, where we can assign a specific mechanism, and by a specific mechanism in these very broad categories. So if you see your nutrient of interest up here, uh, that's great. Uh, we had to stop someplace. These are the ones that are the focus of the Bond project, and coincidentally, happen to be the most immunologically active, at least from a literature standpoint. Uh, so. If you take a look over here, uh, we have a positive control, which is protein energy malnutrition in its various forms. Uh, it's pretty devastating to the immune response, the innate immune response. And it's very likely that this is just not protein energy malnutrition, but all the nutrients and utilizations are affected here. But it's a strong positive control. We have vitamin A, vitamin D, and zinc, which we've just heard about. They cause significant amount of mortality from infectious diseases not so much maybe with vitamin D yet, but they are still working out whether or not uh, to call somebody deficient based on certain plasma levels. So we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, so you can see here that uh, barrier function is impaired by vitamin A and by zinc and by vitamin D. Um, you know, zinc deficiency, mostly barrier function. Selenium, there have been some good models. I think somebody mentioned earlier that there was a virus infection. I think Dr. Ames mentioned the virus infection uh, models. So, uh, you know, there's some impaired immunity there. I highlighted these two, uh, I guess, uh, nutrients and, and the macrophage function together. Uh, I checked with Dr. Checkley last night to see what he was going to present. He was going to present vitamin A in the lung. So this is actually, this study violates the convention, which I just said. These are alveolar macrophages that we isolate from our pigs, and the experiment's pretty simple. You put these cells in culture for 24 hours with retinoic acid, and then we sequence all the transcripts that come off of it by deep sequencing, so we get a couple of uh, you know, 50, 60 million uh, sequences off of these cells. And then we compare them, what was induced, what was repressed, and we do pathway analysis. And this is the standard, I guess, genomics routine now. And the number one canonical pathway that's actually present is, in fact, the vitamin D receptor pathway. And I don't want you to get lost in the alphabet soup here, but this stands out. In ingenuity pathway analysis, they say vitamin D receptor and inflammation interaction. So the number one canonical pathway for vitamin A turns out to be vitamin D. And I think that Dr. Checkley made in some inference to the two of them being important together. And again, the lung macrophage is probably a very significant source of, of, of retinoic acid in the lung. Also a significant source of vitamin D. It was originally thought uh, that calcification in the lungs that happened during tuberculosis was in fact the macrophages making vitamin D and calcification occur occurring in situ. So these are the human data for the same parameters. 
you'll notice a couple of things. The strength of the association goes down. A larger number of question marks come up. There aren't that many studies out there that really have looked at mechanism to that any great degree. The trends are very similar. There's barrier function impairment with vitamin A and vitamin D uh, and zinc. And I have highlighted here just two specific examples I'm going to show you for humans related to barrier function and macrophage function together. So we'll kill two birds with one stone. Uh, this is the gut or any other uh, epithelium. There is a functional barrier consisting of mucus, antimicrobial peptides, uh, and uh, this is a pattern recognition receptor or toll-like receptor. During normal immune homeostasis, this is all in balance, but you get dysregulated production of any one or more of these molecules, then you get micro dysbiosis, inflammation, perhaps bacterial translocation that occurs. What, these particular antimicrobial peptides are an interesting uh, species. This is uh, something that happens in humans and humans only. There is a, oops, sorry, what happened? I turned it off. Oh, oh, there you go. There is a step here that happened on our way to being human during the normal course of swapping DNA out. Uh, a vitamin D response element got inserted into the beginning of this antimicrobial peptide. So this only occurs in humans and no other animals. So what we have here are pathogens binding to the toll-like receptors, stimulating pro-inflammatory cytokines, which turns on vitamin D synthesis by CYP21B1. Vitamin D becoming active, binding to the vitamin D receptor, making this antimicrobial peptides. At the same time, the macrophage is taking these pathogens up. They go into these autophagosomes. The, the antimicrobial peptides bind to the outside of viruses, fungi, bacteria, poke holes in them, which is what we think that happens, and kill them. So it's a very important mechanism. Uh, there's a recent science paper uh, that just illustrates this in uh, to a great, a, a different immune settings that I didn't I want to talk about because it's pretty detailed. So does this thing happen in humans? That happens in cell culture. So what evidence do we have that this is related to human vitamin D status? Well, this is a very recent research note that was published that shows, ignore this, the 75 is supposed to be over here, that people who have a low vitamin D status, there is a, a, a pretty high degree of correlation between this antimicrobial peptide in the blood and vitamin D uh, status in the blood. This study was done a little bit earlier they didn't measure the protein uh, because the assays weren't all that good, but they measured the induction of this messenger RNA after a challenge with a, a toll-like receptor ligand. These are people that had been pre-screened for vitamin D status. Their vitamin D status was less than 75. So that's why it's over here, not here. And they were given uh, vitamin D, uh, 50,000 international units, pretty, pretty large dose, uh, twice a week for five weeks. After the end, they were challenged with these toll-like receptor ligands, and this is the messenger RNA for this particular antimicrobial peptide. So we can say, at least in this instance, vitamin D status uh, has something to do with the production of this peptide, and you'd certainly get it in the blood. Uh, whether this occurs at epithelial cells remains to be demonstrated, but it's a pretty interesting mechanism. So we switch our gears to adaptive immunity. I have basic three functions here, and again, these are extraordinarily complex antigen presenting cell function, T cell function, and B cell function. Uh, what stands out here, very good animal models for the, the nutrients that we've, we've discussed. I'm going to focus on the vitamin A and, and, and T and B cell function in animal models. There is an exquisitely worked out set of metabolic and immunological parameters that have been worked out, probably 100 papers, mostly consistent that show that vitamin A is converted to retinoic acid by a set of dendritic cells. Used to be, we thought that was restricted to the gut. We do know that now other tissues actually do this. We've demonstrated this in macrophages from the lungs. In response to a number of stimuli, including retinoic acid, they make vitamin A into retinoic acid. That retinoic acid is responsible for differentiation of plasma cells and secretory IgA the differentiation of T regulatory cells, which help dampen inflammation, homing of B cells and T cells to the gut, and the, uh, stimulating the function of gamma delta T cells, which, are, which reside in the gut. This is fine and good. 
we have not found evidence for most of these mechanisms in humans. One can imagine trying to, to biopsy gut immune tissue and, and do these studies in, in, the, in the population. There are uh, in, in vitro studies where retinoic acid in combination with different cytokines does cause Treg induction in humans, so that is something that does translate over to species. But we're really looking for evidence that those T regulatory cells actually increase in humans uh, when they're given vitamin A. So again, the, the, these are human studies. You notice the same trends. The, the the pluses are less plus, and there's lots of question marks. Um, so I've decided to focus on the T cell function here. Uh, I wanted to use Dr. Ahmed and Dr. Stevenson's paper as an example of, of, a, of a field trial where uh, people were given two doses of vitamin A uh, that were classified as low. At, uh, again, they were given at two and three weeks, and five weeks they were um, vaccinated. One week post-vaccinated, uh, the cells from their blood were challenged in cell culture, and cytokines were measured and one month post yellow fever vaccination. So let me walk you through this. There's an extraordinary amount of data in this paper, but I wanted to focus on a couple of things. So interleukin-5 is a TH2-associated cytokine. We associated with B cell uh, differentiation, but it's uh, mostly associated with allergic and, and asthmatic responses. And you can see here that people who had gotten the vitamin A supplement make a little bit more and a lot more after uh, measuring these things in culture for a while. Interferon gamma, which is responsible for pro-inflammatory responses and, 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 and immune responses to virus, we kind of see it going down a little bit. And, you know, even at the one month post-vaccination, we don't see a robust TH1 response in response to a vaccine against a virus. So I would say it's not, it's not disappointing. Uh, if you express these uh, two as a ratio of one another, then you see, see significance in the difference of that. Notice, of course, the heterogeneity of the data. So there's precedent for this, actually. Uh, just a year earlier, we published, uh, if you take T cells from humans and culture and give them retinoic acid and stimulate them, within six hours, they start making all of the transcription factors that are responsible for TH2 differentiation, and they make less of the one that's, in, that's responsible for TH1 differentiation. And then here, interleukin-4 is our representative TH2 cytokine. If you take it to the protein level, on this side, it's interleukin-4, interleukin-5, and interleukin-13, a, a trio of cytokines that are made that are TH2 uh, induced, and interferon gamma, which is our TH1. If you give the cells retinoic acid, you get a uniform increase in these cytokines, and you get a decrease. If you use a compound that binds to one of the vitamin A receptors, the retinoic acid receptor alpha, you get the same exact effect. And if you use an antagonist of that, you get a reduction of it. So we've taken a field observation backwards in time and related to the production of transcription factors and then eventually as cells that, that are making uh, TH1 and TH2 cytokines. So I'm, I'm being brief. I'm within 14 minutes and 30 some seconds. The question is, how do they fight infection? Well. A wholly unsatisfactory answer, if you're expecting the big payoff or the smoking gun, is, is that the jury is still out. And there's lots of reasons for this. First and foremost, in intervention trials, the goal is to prevent people from dying. Accessibility to samples, doing tests in the field, you necessarily have to do smaller numbers of people, so your power is going to be lost. And in some ways, I guess it may or may not actually be important to know mechanistically what's going on. So having said that, I started off by saying there's a vast literature on nutrition and immunity. Very few immune-related biomarkers have emerged from that literature that have practical applications in humans. We do know that individuals who have vitamin A or vitamin uh, or zinc deficiency die from infectious diseases, but we don't really know what goes on. Now, I purposely avoided discussing zinc. Uh, vitamin A has six receptors, vitamin D has one, zinc has 2,000 transcription factors. So I, I purposefully avoided talking about it. I think, it's, uh, I think it's necessarily complicated and probably is going to be the toughest one of all to try to figure out. There's 
people in this room that have been pioneers in the field of, of using omics and proteomics, which we're going to hear about, uh, to help us you know, sort out what, what we can measure in the field setting. And there's some thought that this is going to improve our ability to detect mechanism. So I'll just be the devil's advocate and say that by measuring so many things at one time in a heterogeneous population, you actually may be making the situation worse in that you're creating more noise to overcome for things that are likely to change two to threefold. So having said that, I, we've done a couple of studies with our human studies facility, and we've seen that with some microarray data from the blood that, that was there. But nevertheless, I do think this is promising. Uh, the degree of that effect, why don't we see it? Well, I mentioned logistics and cost, but how do we measure deficiency for some of these nutrients? For zinc and, and iron, we use surrogates, for example. Uh, you get an infection, zinc changes, iron changes, vitamin A changes. So we need better tools to measure uh, the immune res or the uh, deficiency. Uh, I grouped things according to real easy whether or not it was a severity of deficiency. Some of those studies we, that I uh, showed in there, you know, the animals were practically dead. And in some of them, they were marginally deficient. Uh, there are multiple deficiencies that exist and synergies that happen. Uh, there's age-dependent effects, genetics, and I'll throw this out, possible epigenetic uh, events. I think Dr. Checkley had referred to some epigenetics in vitamin D work, but there are some precedent in the literature. In animal studies, if you mess with the zinc status, you get uh, effects that last beyond the generation. Either you supplement uh, and have immunosuppression that goes through three uh, generations. Uh, uh, this has been reported on multiple occasions. I'm not a zinc expert. I don't know how to interpret these, but that's something that should be, a, I guess, something to think about uh, from a clinical trial standpoint. There are some studies that show differential DNA methylation in children with uh, vitamin A status, and recently uh, very specific DNA methylation site modifications by people with different vitamin D status, and some interventional studies with folic acid show an increase in whole genome methylation with folic acid supplementation. So having said that, uh, this is with a side of slide I think Dr. West wanted me to avoid, but I'm going to throw it here in the last thing. So the nutrients by themselves, do, you know, they exist in single deficiency, but how complicated and how mechanistic can we get with data? And I'm going to just rely on cell culture. So this is a gene called FOXP3, which is responsible for T regulatory cell differentiation in mice and in humans. It has a bunch of sites in the promoter region that have these CPG islands that are folic acid dependent for the methylation. We have a whole bunch of transcription factors that either bind to the promoter or enhancer regions that have zinc. We have a vitamin A responsive element here in the promoter and in the enhancer, and we have a good old vitamin D responsive element in there. So one can imagine if you are marginal in zinc, folic acid, vitamin A, and vitamin D at the same time, that there may be some synergy that's involved in the regulation of, of this particular gene. So I think that's the, my payoff slide, and I think I'm finished at this point. So uh, if there's time, I'll have, entertain any questions. I think we actually do have time for one or two questions. Where are my helpers? <laughs> Really enjoyed your talk. I wonder whether you would comment on uh, the relationship between vitamin D um, and, and innate immune response factors. And, and I wonder whether there's a difference between the various types of innate immune uh, effectors, for instance, you know, those that are sort of reinforcing the barrier and anti-bactericidal, you might expect them to be positively regulated by vitamin D, but alarmants, danger signals might be negatively correlated uh, with vitamin D status. So when you dig the data in that fashion, do you find that differential, or is everybody that sort of relates to innate immunity positively regulated? So, by, so I, let me, I believe, summarize your question. I, I believe it relates to the uh, relationship between vitamin A and vitamin D and interactions in innate immunity. Is that what I... Yeah. Well, it's, it's kind of tough because uh, the pharmaceutical industry many years ago developed non-calcemic analogs of 
vitamin D to treat uh, immune, autoimmune diseases. It, it, they're hellaciously immunosuppressive when given in high doses. So having said that, there is the potential if you dampen the immune response enough uh, that you essentially open yourself up to uh, being more susceptible to, to an infectious agent. And I think the fact that these enzymes are regulated by cytokines, I think the body knows what it's doing with its own vitamin D. I think if you provide 125 hydroxy vitamin D to people, uh, you may be bypassing those regulatory mechanisms, and that's where you may be getting in trouble. Thank you, Keith. Thank you very much, Harry. That was exactly at the level that I could understand. Uh, we're going to uh, switch gears. Um, and we talk a lot about undernourished, underserved populations. But um, North America has, uh, has nutrition problems as well. And probably no one has thought about this more than Dr. Regan Bailey at the Office of Dietary Supplements at the uh, National Institutes of Health. Regan is a nutritional epidemiologist. Uh, some of you may know her because she runs the Mary Frances Picciano uh, Dietary Supplement Research Seminar every May that hundreds of people go to, including a number of our, of our students. Uh, Regan is going to talk to us uh, about uh, trends in micronutrient intake and status, what's going on in the United States in, you know, 14 minutes. <laughs> Regan. It's not easy to summarize uh, five years of your research in such a short time, but for Keith, I will give it a try. It's a true honor to be part of this group today, and I've really enjoyed all the previous talks. And because we've talked a lot about some of these concepts, we can go through the background of my presentation rather quickly in saying that whether it's an intake or concentration distribution for a nutrient, too much or too little is going to put individuals at risk. And so if you believe this sort of paradigm that I'm putting forward and flip it on its head, you can see where the Food and Nutrition Board, the dietary reference intakes uh, uh, stem from. And I'm going to focus on this part of the distribution. So below the EAR, I will call it the estimated average requirement. And this is the uh, cut point that is used for population or group level data in which there's a high prevalence for inadequacy. We don't say there's deficiency below this. It's a high prevalence for inadequacy. And in order to assess who's at risk in any group, what you want is a usual intake. You don't want to look at a one-day snapshot of someone's intake and classify them as at risk or not, because we know that dietary recommendations are intended to be met over time. You don't necessarily have to have your vitamin C at X amount every single day. But overall, long-term average, are you meeting that requirement? And as I mentioned, this is what's necessary for characterizing those tails of the distribution. Who's at risk? The problem is, is that usual intakes are not directly observable. We know that self-reported dietary assessment methods are fraught with error, and if we ignore this measurement error, we have bias estimates. However, there are statistical modeling techniques that are available to us to help reduce some of this bias. And in general, the approach that is used is multiple daily reports are collected, and you separate the within and the between person variability to establish usual intake. So the within person variability is what makes me different on day one from myself on day two. So once we take that individual variability out, that's how we get our usual intakes. And the data that I will be presenting today all come from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, which has a host of information on health and nutritional factors in the US, but I will be focusing specifically on the diet and supplements. We saw this slide earlier today. This is a very broad brushstroke of the US population, so looking at everyone older than the age of two. If we just looked at the percent of this population that would have intakes below the EAR from nutrients that are naturally occurring in foods, we would see a pretty grim picture. In the US, though, we have mandatory and voluntary fortification and enrichment, and you see that this lowers 
the percent who would be considered at risk. Substantially for some nutrients, specifically for folic acid, you can see this big drop. Um, but not so much when we look at the minerals, because with the exception of iron, there's not much mandatory or voluntary fortification of our food supply. But not only do we want to look at usual intakes, we need to look at total nutrient intake. So nutrients can also come from supplements and also from both over-the-counter and prescription medications. And this is particularly salient in the U.S. context where we have a high proportion of individuals in specific age groups that use dietary supplements containing nutrients. And so if we only look at nutrient intakes from foods, we're really underestimating nutrient exposure, particularly for foods that, um, excuse me, particularly for nutrients that are not ubiquitous in foods like vitamin D. And while we're not going to be talking about upper limits today, for some of the upper limits are only for supplemental sources like magnesium and folic acid. So let's dive right into the data on infants, toddlers, children, adolescents, and teens, who I'll just call children for uh, sake of ease. So in the purple bars, we're going to look at children who do not use dietary supplements and the percent who would be considered at risk. And you, this is for two to eight-year-olds specifically. And in the blue bars are the same estimates for children who use dietary supplements. So you can see a big drop for things like vitamin D and vitamin E. In this age group, we saw no difference in the percent at risk for users and non-users for a whole host of nutrients. And that's simply because the diets of this age group are pretty good, by and large. There was 0% inadequacy to begin with for these nutrients, so adding supplements didn't help lower the prevalence of inadequacy. Moving on to our slightly older children, 9 to 13-year-olds, we can see that there are a few more micronutrients here with differences between users and non-users with that same trend in vitamin D and E emerging. Children 9 to 13 in general are doing pretty good for iron, B12, selenium, copper, folate, and B6. But it's important to note that even among those children in this age group who are using a dietary supplement, calcium and vitamin D intakes still remain low. And finally, moving on to our teenagers, I had to put it on two slides because their diets are terrible. <laughs> Not terrible, but relative to the younger children. And uh, we can see the prevalence of inadequacies, inadequacies here for a number of minerals and a similar trend observed for the vitamins. So to summarize this age group, we did see a higher prevalence of nutrient inadequacies than in younger children. And this is a group for which supplement use is the lowest. And so among this group, teens who use a supplement really confer a benefit, but there's a very low prevalence of use in this group. So finally, um, I'll talk really briefly about the adult data. Uh, we published a series of papers. We know that people who use supplements are different than people who don't. We know they tend to be older, they're more likely to be white, have higher educational attainment, uh, have more physical activity, less smoking, and moderate alcohol consumption. So we were interested in looking at why are these people using supplements then? Uh, are their nutrient intakes falling short, or are they using them for added protection? And I'll tell you, the diet quality of adults who use supplements is already much better than those who don't use supplements. So they're already adding to uh, intakes that are by and large adequate for a number of vitamins and minerals. So I'll show you that the differences here. So this slide is set up just slightly differently than the ones before. And the blue bars are adults who don't use a supplement, the percent who have intakes below the EAR, quite high. In this red slide, or in the red bars, we're looking at users, but just their food. We're not even looking at their supplements yet. You can see that they have a, l a lower prevalence of inadequacies. And then, of course, when we add the supplements, you see the decrease there. And this slide is set up the same way for a selected uh, uh, vitamins. And I wanted to pull out calcium in females to make the point that the prevalence of use of a supplement really makes a difference. So women tend to have a high usage of calcium supplements, and you can see the big differences across all age groups for who's meeting the recommendation, particularly 
salient here if you look at these older women. Older women, I don't mean older, I mean in terms of this. Anyway, women over the age of 50, um, nearly 90% would be uh, inadequate, have inadequate intakes. But even so, 30% with the use of supplements still aren't meeting the calcium guidelines. So to summarize what I presented, adult users tend to have higher vitamin and mineral intakes from their food sources alone. We did not find this in children. We found the diet quality among users and non-users in children was similar. Supplements help all age groups meet the EAR for almost every micronutrient with the exception of potassium. And that's because potassium is not ubiquitously found in dietary supplements. It's, but it's particularly important for things we saw the big drops for vitamin D and for vitamin E. Now I started with a broad brush stroke and I want to end with a broad brush stroke. So adding users and non-users all in one big pot and what would be the prevalence of inadequacies in the U.S. And we, I have them here arranged by um, their relative frequency. And it's important to note that this is dietary data. There is also data that is available for biomarkers. And when we examine biomarker data, we see a much lower prevalence than 70% when we look at the total US population. It's still there. But there are discrepancies between dietary intake and biomarkers of nutrient status. So I just want to point that out. The data that I have presented to you that our team has worked on aligns closely with the dietary guidelines for Americans uh, for calcium and vitamin D. As I mentioned, potassium um, is not found in dietary supplements and remains a nutrient of concern in the US as well as dietary fiber, as well as iron folate and B12 within specific age, gender, or life stage groups. So well, that's all I have to say, and I'd be happy to have any questions if anyone has any. Thank you. Thank you, Reagan. It was a great talk, and you are on time, and we have time for questions. Everybody looks so sleepy. <laughs> I could do a dance. I, I'm not asleep. Have you considered <laughs> iodide in your in your analysis? There's no database uh, for dietary iodine, so we haven't been able to examine that yet. It's something we're interested in. There's a <laughs> iodine initiative in our office at the Office of Dietary Supplements now, and so that's definitely on our minds. Um, you said that children are meeting their nutrition requirements overall, but then you know, you're also hearing about how kids are now developing diabetes younger and younger and the obesity rates going up for younger kids. So what kind of explains those two factors? Well, I, I don't want you to take home the message that the diets of children are okay. Um, the diets of children two to eight are the most nutritionally adequate among all children. And so these are looking at dietary intakes relative to the standard reference. This is from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, so it's nationally representative. It's not looking at high-risk groups. It's not looking at obese children or diabetic children. There would be people in the sample that have those conditions, but it's not looking at higher-risk groups. So. so vitamin D is a bit special because we get most of it from sun, but um, they supplemented milk, but it was the wrong food. They put too little in, and 75% of African Americans are lactose intolerant, as long, along with 50 million other people in the US. So it really wasn't the right thing. Now, I guess they're putting some in orange juice, but um, well, if you eat a lot of fish, you can get some, but... Uh. No, I, I think that's an important point, and I think that the, the dietary reference intakes are set, assuming that this is the requirement from diet, not factoring in sun exposure. And I also think that in the report, they mentioned that um, African Americans are most likely to have different calcium and vitamin D economy than uh, European descent, 
and because we see lower vitamin D, serum vitamin D levels, but we don't see the problems with bone health parameters. Certainly different diseases, yes. In autism, uh, if you correct for social class, blacks have twice the rate of having autistic kids. So there it is showing up. And Somalis who move to Sweden or Minneapolis have five times the rate of the local population. So um, I wouldn't say that these genetic differences are necessarily negated. Oh, no, I wasn't trying to say that. I, I, I am simply suggesting that there's data to support those are differential vitamin D and calcium economy. That's all. How much is the higher rate of deficiencies in elderly simply due to lower food intake and less exercise? Yes. There is uh, definitely a precipitous decrease in total calorie intakes with aging, and so it's tougher to meet your requirements with less food unless you're taking a supplement or really trying to have a high-quality diet. Uh, just one question, and then we'll move on to our next speaker. Uh, it seems like, the, in some respects, those who need the supplements more are not available. They're not accessible to them, or they're not taking them. Do you have any ideas on how, how to correct that imbalance? How, how do we find, motivate, you know, uh, evidence-based supplementation for those groups that whose diets really are poor? Yeah, that's a great question, and I would like to hear what DSM in the audience has to say about that. How can we target those who need the supplements the most? Because in the U.S., it's definitely the worried well uh, that we're seeing in in our at least from our data. But. Maybe in our open dialogue. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you, uh, Dr. Bailey. That was that was a great talk. Um, in the context of um, trying to cover lots of bases, but not exhaustively by any means, um, we're going to shift gears again. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, Parul Christian is going to speak to us about uh, evidence emerging on the effects of early life developmental nutrition exposures, malnutrition, micronutrient deficiencies, and what may be effects later on in, 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 in offspring. Uh, Parul is a professor uh, in the Department of International Health, a close colleague. She's worked a great deal in uh, Nepal, in uh, Bangladesh, conducting trials. Uh, she's uh, leading studies in Malawi and in Mozambique. Uh, on, on child feeding evaluation and uh, is going to give us this perspective today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Keith, and I'm delighted to be presenting uh, today in front of this uh, wonderful audience, and thank you for hanging in there. I know it's pretty late in the day. Um, as Keith mentioned, I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, our work that is derived from some of the randomized uh, control trials that we have been doing in Nepal. And previous speakers have alluded to um, the early life and the developmental period as being critical. And uh, uh, there is mention of programming, there's mention of transgenerational effects, and so I'm going to show you some uh, emerging evidence with regard to long-term impact of um, micronutrients, especially interventions of micronutrients on uh, outcomes of interest. So I wanted to start with the point um, that the fetal life is a critical period of development in, in humans, and of course the embryonic period is particularly vulnerable to um, uh, teratogenic effects, et cetera. But uh, throughout the fetal period, uh, uh, nutritional deprivation can lead to um, dysfunction. Um, and I'm going to be focusing on interventions uh, of micronutrients during this critical period of uh, fetal development. Of course, the supplementation is indirectly done through maternal uh, uh, supplementation during pregnancy. So just to give you a perspective on what we um, look at generally in these kinds of studies, uh, our outcomes tend to be more short-term in nature, and, um, and uh, 
when we look at long-term effects, of course, we are talking about uh, at later ages, when we look at um, effects of the impact uh, the short-term consequences may have had on uh, certain systems, certain organs, such as uh, the central nervous system or the growth and uh, accretion of muscle mass or body composition in the short term, which can then manifest into effects on the immune function or work capacity later in life. And then within the uh, group of effects, uh, which is uh, termed as metabolic programming, uh, you can see that happening in the short term during the period of deprivation, which can have then long-lasting effects on outcomes of diabetes, uh, obesity, and coronary heart disease, et cetera, uh, in adulthood and in um, old age. Um, this is a, a conceptual framework that was derived uh, from a, a literature review that um, I conducted with then my doctoral student. Now she is um, assistant professor at UC Davis, Christine Stewart. And this is just to look at where is the evidence to suggest that micronutrient deficiency in the mother, especially during pregnancy, can have these uh, effects on organs and systems. And we were able to find uh, some evidence to show that there is a link. Uh, most of this literature is derived from uh, animal studies, but there are some observational human studies which have also shown that maternal micronutrient deficiency through restricted fetal growth and development can have a range of effects across various organ systems and then specific micronutrients are implicated in this. And so the renal function, cardiovascular function, the development of pancreas and beta cells, um, pulmonary function, as well as uh, how body composition um, um, occurs uh, over the course of life can all be influenced by specific micronutrients uh, leading to an increased risk of chronic um, disease, cardiometabolic risk. And so today I'm going to talk about uh, some of these specific nutrients, largely because we've done these intervention studies using uh, micronutrients and supplements uh, that are listed here. But now looking at uh, not just short-term out outcomes, the original trials were actually designed to look at the immediate outcomes. But in this presentation, I'm going to focus on long-term survival, on long-term growth, cognitive uh, development and function, cardiometabolic health, to some degree, uh, immune function and lung function. And so I'll take you um, to our study site in Nepal. We have been uh, operational in this uh, area and have a research site since uh, the past 25 years. In fact, this year we are celebrating the 25th year of this research site. And um, in 2006 and 2008, we conducted a very large um, cross-sectional survey of all our existing cohorts from trials that had been conducted previously over the uh, previous 15 years or so. So uh, when you uh, think about Nepal, you think about the Himalayas, the mountains, and um, you can, if you're fortunate, get a good glimpse of them from the Kathmandu Valley. But our study area is located in the, in the flat uh, plains of Nepal in the southern part uh, of uh, Nepal adjacent to India. It's a very agrarian um, rural uh, area where a lot of rice and corn are grown. And this is a typical kind of environment where um, small mothers give birth to small babies who are raised uh, and grow up as uh, kids with stunting. And uh, as adolescents also, they are uh, nutritionally um, uh, lacking. And so this is our field site. Our study um, is called the Nepal Nutrition Intervention Project Sarlahi because it's located in the Sarlahi district, uh, in short, uh, NIPS. And these are the uh, cohorts that I'm going to talk about. Um, the first one is a child vitamin A supplementation uh, trial cohort. I'm not going to speak much about this because this doesn't uh, address the intervention period, uh, the fetal period that I've, I was referring to. So I'm going to focus on the two uh, trials, the NIPS 2 and 3 studies in which maternal supplementation was done in the context of randomized control trials. And then, as I said, the follow-up was done simultaneously for all the cohorts. and um, 
um, we did a whole range of uh, field-based, home-based uh, measurements in, in young children uh, at different ages, depending on the, um, the age of the cohort. And we took uh, blood pressure measurements. We did waist circumference measurements. Uh, blood drawing was done in, in um, a subsample. A full anthropometry, et cetera, was also conducted. Uh, the blood was processed and in part uh, analyzed in the field itself uh, with uh, lipid profiles um, um, uh, being assessed, glucose, HbA1c being me measured in fasting blood. And we also um, collected fasting urine to look at uh, albumin uh, creatinine ratio for uh, kidney function. And so I'll talk about first the vitamin A trial, which was a randomized controlled trial of weekly vitamin A and beta carotene supplementation to women of reproductive age. So this study was done among all women, irrespective of whether they were pregnant or not. So, so a lot of them received the supplements preconceptionally into their pregnancy. And this study was done between 93 and 97. And uh, the children at the time of the follow-up were 9 to 12 years of age. And we looked at these outcomes uh, in those children. And uh, Will Checkley already presented some of these data, but we actually did this work in the field with handheld spirometers. So that was pretty exciting, and the training that it required was, was pretty uh, intensive. But um, in this study, maternal vitamin A supplementation, as is to be expected, raised serum retinol levels. And with um, increase in serum retinol uh, levels in the mothers, lung function was uh, improved using FEV1. And so this is the data that um, Will presented, so I won't um, uh, talk much about it as, except to say that vitamin A supplementation uh, in the moms increased lung volume in the offspring at 9 to 13 years of age, and these are the median differences between the vitamin A group and the placebo group. Um, one of our doctoral students also looked at um, vitamin A status and immune system development in the same cohort. And so she uh, looked at B1A lymphocytes, which um, as natural antibodies, and B1A lymphocytes are uh, constitutively, uh, uh, they produce most of the natural antibodies and are, um, uh, these arise from an early wave of progenitor cells that are unique to fetal life. And in mice experiments, vitamin A has been shown to regulate early lymphopoiesis and uh, in deficiency uh, during the cr this critical fetal period, uh, vitamin A deficiency compromises B1 cell populations. So these natural antibodies, um, uh, which she measured, pro uh, you know, they protect against bacterial pathogens and oxidative damage, and therefore they may have an impact both on the infant's um, host resistance and development, but also long-term chron chronic disease risk. And what she found was that the supplementation in the mom, the vitamin A supplementation, increased this, this population, this concentration of natural antibodies in the offspring at 9 to 13 years of age. Um, and you see the same uh, relationship with maternal serum retinol and concentration of NAB. We looked at blood pressure, uh, high blood pressure in these children as well. Um, and here, um, what I'm showing is that overall, it did not seem that either of the two supplements, vitamin A or beta carotene, um, had an impact on high blood pressure. But among children who had high waist circumference, there seemed to be a protective effect of the supplementation on, on uh, high blood pressure. Moving on, uh, we did another trial also in the same population. This study was done to actually address uh, one of these questions that came up earlier on, which was why, why do we do only single micronutrients? So we, we actually wanted to look at the outcome of birth weight, and we, we wanted to see which micronutrients were most limiting and critical in this uh, environment where there were multiple micronutrient deficiencies. And we uh, went after the ones that we thought, thought were mo most important, folic acid, folic acid, iron, folic acid, iron, and zinc. And then we also had a multiple micronutrient supplement in this five-arm trial. 
All the women got vitamin A because our previous study had shown a benefit of vitamin A um, uh, to moms um, in pregnancy. So one of the first things, and this is actually the, the same trial that I should um, remind Scott, <laughs> Shane about, that this is the trial uh, that you had come to visit, and the babies were being born at that time. And in, 20, 000, in 2006 and uh, eight, the, these kids were now seven to nine years of age, and so we followed their long-term survival. And what you can see here is, this is the blue line is the control line. So that's, it's good that it's at the bottom. This is a survival curve. All the other groups did better in terms of long-term survival um, um, of the children, but the, the group that did the best was actually the iron and folic acid group and not the multiple micronutrient group. Uh, when we looked at outcomes of blood pressure and uh, insulin resistance, uh, we found no differences between groups. Um, they're all identical in, in terms of their uh, uh, levels of um, blood pressure and uh, markers of insulin resistance. Uh, but we did look at uh, this condition called metabolic syndrome, which is um, defined as three or more conditions um, of cardiometabolic risk coexisting together. And in that um, definition of metabolic syndrome, we were able to show that the folic acid supplement actually significantly reduced the risk of MS in, in this study. None of the other three groups uh, did the same thing. And then uh, microalbuminuria, which is a marker for kidney function, was examined. And again, folic acid um, alone or when it was uh, given with iron and zinc uh, significantly reduced the risk of microalbuminuria. Um, Prenatal zinc supplementation, actually, uh, so the combination of, again, iron, folic acid, and zinc, had an, a significant impact on uh, linear growth. Height was higher in children who had whose mothers had received that supplement se at seven years of age. And they also had lower adiposity, so their tricep skin folds and subscapular skin folds were, were smaller, and their total uh, arm fat area was, was smaller. And cognition was... Um, one of the outcomes in, in this study as well. Uh, this was another uh, study funded by NIH in which we followed th the groups of children whose mothers had received the various combinations of micronutrients. And we did a whole um, battery of tests on them to look at general intelligence, motor function, executive function, and fine motor function. And in this, um, uh, out for this outcome, what we found was, again, iron and folic acid seemed to have the most benefit for um, the whole range of functions that we had looked at, um, whereas the other combinations uh, did not seem to have that effect. And uh, just to emphasize that the um, critical window for brain development and function might actually be the fetal period because we were also able to follow a separate cohort of children who were, as preschoolers, had received uh, and in, have, had participated in a trial and had received iron and folic acid um, or zinc um, or the combination of two versus a placebo. And in this uh, cohort, we were not able to show any difference between groups uh, with child supplementation on these same outcomes of cognition and motor function. So just to quickly summarize um, the findings with regard to maternal vitamin A supplementation, uh, as I mentioned, it, uh, I showed you it increased lung function and volume, although we do need to know what the long-term impact on pulmonary health would be of, the, of this finding. Um, overall, there was no uh, impact on prevalence of high blood pressure, but it reduced um, the odds of blood pressure, high blood pressure in the kids that may be at higher risk with high waist circumference. And vitamin A enhanced uh, the natural, uh, natural antibody concentrations of pre-adolescent children. This, again, likely reflects a greater number of um, the NAB secreting uh, B1A cells. Uh, folic acid, zinc, and iron um, effects uh, are summarized here. Folic acid reduced uh, cardiometabolic risk and improved kidney function in the offspring. Iron reduced child mortality, long-term child mortality, and also improved um, aspects of intellectual function, uh, including executive function as assessed 
um, by looking at working memory and inhibitory control, um, as well as fine motor functioning. Zinc supplementation improved postnatal child growth and reduced adiposity. Um, the evidence for multiple micronutrient was, was quite limited across these various combinations of micronutrients we tested. I just want to end with a couple of future um, um, thoughts for future direction. Um, cohorts uh, that we followed were still quite young, and so they were not likely to have a very high cardiometabolic risk. Uh, especially in this environment, which was very undernourished. So there was very little evidence of overweight or obesity. Uh, I showed you that first, in that first um, slide, that the critical period of time for, um, in the fetal period is really the early pregnancy period. And um, there are very few studies which have actually looked at preconceptional or early pregnancy interventions. And, uh, there is a lot of uh, evidence from animal and epigenetic studies in humans even showing that the preconceptional period may be, may be very important to evaluate. And then uh, there are very few trials like this which have looked at maternal interventions and followed cohorts of their offspring to look at these kinds of longer term outcomes. And so these are clearly needed more in, in many uh, contexts. And this is our NIP staff who I have to thank for all the incredible work they continue to do. Thank you. Thank you very much for all your You're awesome. time, and we have time for a few questions. That was a very interesting talk. Um, I was surprised by the multiple um, vitamins and minerals. Why wasn't it at least as good as the folic acid and zinc? So I think that this is a, a Professor Ames question. Because <laughs> we've been struggling with this uh, for a number of years now. It's these combinations, you know, you were talking about the two pluses, the iron, the zincs, the coppers, the calciums all together. Uh, and, you know, so with birth weight, which was our primary outcome, we had seen that as well, that iron and folic acid improved birth weight. But with zinc added to the combination, the birth weight effect was removed. And so that was puzzling. And then the multiple micronutrient actually improved birth weight after that negative inhibitory effect of uh, zinc was, so, it, so I think the nutrient-nutrient interactions are, uh, at least from this work, are important to look at. We, um, we, there's a lot, m much more we know about iron and zinc, but with a, a number of these other ones, there are 15 nutrients in the multiple micronutrient uh, pill. So um, I think that we need to do some smaller, really elegant studies to just look at the, the uh, you know, interaction effects that you see in, in and in animal models, you don't do that. You kind of remove what you, you create deficiency of one nutrient at a time. So, yes, Dr. Rains. It's just the minerals interfere with each other. So, iron and zinc. Right. Uh, the, the transporters, sometimes they both go into one. So, you just have to be very careful. If you get too much of one minute, I think also what is more deficient in an environment may be important. So the context, as people were alluding to that, might be part of it. This was a very iron deficient environment. We had, in a previous study, we had shown about 60%, 65% prevalence of iron deficiency anemia in pregnancy. So that might be another um, thing to consider. Pearl, I have a question related to uh, the, the antibodies that were generated, I had discussed it with Amanda when she was doing her PhD thesis that one could interpret the presence of self-antibodies seven or eight years after, uh, I guess, delivery uh, as a bad thing hmm. because autoimmune disease is often accompanied by autoantibodies. So any thoughts on that? Or is that unfair <laughs> to ask you? <laughs> well, I'm not prepared to answer that question. I'm sure Amanda, uh, if she's listening to this in, in Zambia, would be the right person to ask. Um, I, I'm, I learned 
from her work about the potential for even looking at something like natural antibodies later in life um, as a, an outcome of an, an, a fetal uh, exposure. So I, I'll let you and her figure it out. <laughs> uh, thanks, Parul. Um, you partially answered my question already, so I'll twist it a little bit and ask you um, about what your reflections are on the policy implications of the work you just presented. Particularly, I find I've always found it a little hard myself to understand and take away um, when you have one nutrient that's good for one thing, but it's not good for something else, but that other nutrient's really good for this. And how do you sort through that and figure out what the right policy recommendation is? Do you just choose the outcome you're most interested in? Or you know, tell me what you think about that. Yeah. So I think. Um, I'm glad Regan presented just before I did, because what are we doing in the US to me is is maybe an example <laughs> of what can be done, which is to try and address the micronutrient deficiency and looking at diets and looking at biochemical indicators to see what what is deficient. We we kind of tend to think about where is going where is there going to be a huge public health impact? That's what's really uh, driven policy and recommendations and programs, but maybe we have advanced to a stage where, where we can start thinking about reducing micronutrient deficiency for its own sake. And um, I was pretty convinced with what Professor Ames was talking about early on. And there's so many so many things that we um, may need these micronutrients for that we don't even assess. So we, we just assessed a few things, and you're finding some effects and some differences. Um, it's a hard question. I think from the work that Bob presented and, and the meta-analysis uh, with also the Bangladesh trial data added on, I, I think it seems like um, now we have, you know, the pooled estimate seems to be pretty convincing, especially particularly with regard to um, the impact on fetal growth and, and re reduction in low birth weights such that we can actually change from iron and folic acid to multiple micronutrient. I think these longer term outcomes are, are interesting and we continue to um, develop the evidence base for seeing what else, you know, what other studies can pro uh, add to the, to the knowledge base. <coughs> Do you do you have um, I'm over here? Do you have um, you gave 15 micronutrients? Do you have samples on any of your subjects for the measurements of the nutrients before you gave them to see who was really low? Yeah, so uh, I didn't have time to show all the um, two years of work that went into just doing about 10 different uh, biochemical indicators of micronutrient status. And there's a lot of deficiency in this population. Across the board, there was nothing that they were not deficient in. Maybe copper, they didn't have low copper. But other than that, it, there's a high burden of multiple micronutrient deficiency, which is a good segue to, I think, Keith's talk, which is about the assessment of micronutrient deficiencies in, in these populations. Probably move on. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, so we have two short, pithy presentations uh, to broaden our thinking about how to assess and where we might be going in the future with respect to assessment and prevention of micronutrient deficiencies. And um, um, there's really no better person to pith our minds. Uh, <laughs> then uh, Dr. Alan Labrique, uh, who is one of our newest associate professors, full-time associate professors, just was uh, promoted this past month. So associate professor Alan Labrique, would you please come up here and share your magic with us about your vision of the future through micronutrients? Barbara, what are you going to do to it? You're going to download it on your no, is it, is it earphone or something. Let me try. Let me see something here. Siri, what's my micronutrient status? I don't know what that means. <laughs> Clearly, Keith hasn't upgraded to the new, uh, new version of the uh, technology. So you'll have to forgive him if, uh, 
if some of his remarks are in the past century. But <laughs> and, and as someone who, who started his uh, biology research career pithing frogs, I really appreciate that last comment. <laughs> Thanks, Keith. So I was asked in a very succinct way to present uh, something that I do t talk quite a bit about these days. And it's uh, another hat that I wear here at the school uh, as the, the director of a new center, the uh, Global M Health Initiative uh, here at Hopkins. So we're barely uh, 130 few, few years from when uh, Alexander Graham Bell made that first seminal phone call to his colleague in the room next door. And we find ourselves in a state of affairs where there are nearly as many mobile phone connections as there are human beings on this planet. It's generated this new field of research and innovation, which we like to call M-Health, a state of uh, research and, and uh, really innovation where we try to find out ways in which we can leverage the ubiquitous ownership of mobile technologies, even in the most remote rural populations where many of us have described our work over the course of today. I think the, the seminal quality here of this uh, opportunity for us as public health practitioners is that we're looking at a space that's untethered from those fixed site facilities where we tended to do research in the past, but yet still remaining connected to the broader health systems which uh, we work within. Here at Hopkins, we have a robust ecosystem of innovation that spans the entire university, where to date we have about 105 M Health projects being done, exploring ways and really quantifying the impact that mobile technologies can have on outcomes ranging from nutrition to clinical care uh, in the spectrum of what we do. But really fundamentally, we're talking about three things that mobile technologies enable us to do here. Connecting people. Everything we've heard about today in terms of micronutrient uh, alleviation programs or health system interventions is about linking individuals within a health system, those actors that are critical to connect to each other and to the information systems which support their work. But public health is also fundamentally about compressing time. The time it takes from diagnosis to care or the identification of a condition to the rectification of that, of that status. And I think finally, the most exciting way that we see mobile telephony changing our paradigm of uh, global health is in creating new windows of opportunity, where as public health interventionists, we find ourselves able to act on these windows of time which we did not have access to in the past. And I'll give you a few examples of these. There are three main ways in which M Health technologies are enabling the work that we do in the global health space. These range from patient, provider, to health system interventions. At the patient level, we're really looking at improving access to information, information about diet, information about food systems, modifying behavior through supporting behavior change uh, strategies such as improving diet and nutritional uh, interventions. Activity monitoring. Many of us have done work in nutrition monitoring exercise and caloric expenditure over the course of the day. And these technologies are now embedded in every single mobile phone that each one of you is carrying in the room today. But as I think about the last two speakers and this challenge of getting better data about nutritional intake as an example, individuals now across the world are, are, are recording their daily dietary intake at levels of granularity that we could not imagine in a, in a research context. For providers, we're talking about workflow management, decision support tools to enable clinicians to adhere to clinical decision uh, algorithms, but also enhancing our ability to improve surveillance and tracking, being able not just to detect outbreaks, but to identify and follow kids through time as they go through those essential first years of life. At the health system level, we're looking at innovations which have changed the way we monitor our workforce. Today, Parul, Keith, myself, we can log into a portal and see where our 850 staff in rural Bangladesh have been collecting mid-upper arm circumferences over the course of the past two days. And then finally, being able to access that data in a much more rapid turnaround time has really transformed the, the rate at which we can do research and the cost of this research in uh, large populations. So the question is, in these contexts where despite the population density, women are delivering in fairly isolated uh, locations, where micronutrient access to information and food supplies are uh, strained and in, in limited shortage, in places where providers are often isolated from the health systems which they, which they serve, how can we enhance their ability 
to do the functions that they're tasked with, but also make them feel like they're part of the health system uh, which they're serving. And finally, as Dr. Black brought up, how do we take these interventions of known efficacy and help them to achieve the effective coverage that we know will have the greatest impact on uh, lives saved? So over the past 10 years, we've seen not just hundreds, but tens of thousands of mHealth pilot studies. In fact, someone joked the other day that there are more pilots in the domain of mHealth than there are in the US Air Force. So you know, I'll give you a few examples of this. One, one uh, recent study that we did in Bangladesh, 170,000 women we surveyed at the beginning of last year, 71% of these rural, rural households that represent a vast swath of the greater Gangetic floodplain owned phones despite only 23% of those homes having access to electricity. Now you talk about a game-changing paradigm, this is it right here. We asked ourselves, could we access that critical window of time shortly after birth when the risk of mortality is the greatest? So we had to know when women were going into labor. We empowered women with a way to send a text message to us when they were going into labor. And 500 pregnancies later, 90% of the time, we had a skilled nurse midwife attending that birth in a context where 85% of births occur in the home. We've now deployed very sophisticated systems that are under evaluation in rural Bangladesh, which start with the basic functions of census enumeration, pregnancy surveillance. These systems that have been part of our research enterprise for decades are now being delivered by frontline health workers off the government of Bangladesh to do these functions as part of their service delivery uh, activities. But more importantly, enabling us to uh, mobilize emergency referrals and support when those obstetric events take place. But then providing women with that supporting information about adequate nutrition and, and healthcare during those early months of life. With WHO in uh, India, we're testing these tablet-based systems which take those uh, antiquated tomes of paper that they used to carry around into digital interfaces that allow them to target limited resources to pregnant women who need it the most, tracking both postnatal antenatal care, but also nutritional adequacy and access to essential things like iron folic acid supplementation. We can also transform the way we do counseling, enhancing those paper-based flip charts about diet and nutrition with interactive video footage that's now available at the point of care in these rural communities. The MAMA project, sponsored by USAID, allows pregnant women to receive gestationally aged appropriate messages about their pregnancy from diet all the way to newborn care. UNICEF is using rapid SMS and child count to track the mid upper arm circumference of under five children to be able to map and target resources uh, in these nutritional monitoring programs of the Millennium Villages uh, projects in Sub-Saharan Africa. Novartis has launched a phenomenal project called SMS for Life that enables them to manage those essential commodity supply chains to simple text messaging strategies that notify them when a particular commodity is in short supply. So imagine using these and leveraging these systems for a nutritional commodity uh, ascertainment. But the future is here, gentlemen and ladies, that we have the technology to do on-phone microscopy. We're able to do ultrasound. The FDA has approved this Mobisante device to do field-based ultrasound using a mobile system. We have pill bottles, whether these are micronutrients or, or antibiotics, that beep at you when you have forgotten to take a dose. Not only that, they will call your wife or your mother-in-law to say that you haven't taken your drugs. Please contact your, uh, your uh, loved one and let them know they need to take their medication. <laughs> But there are also new paradigms. We think about over-the-counter devices that are now available to do everything from ECG to weight and urinalysis at the home. That individuals can do these assessments and upload data on a daily basis in real time, supplementing those data points that we need in our randomized trials. And what's interesting is all of this data is wirelessly transmitted to the data servers. So again, it's important to consider quality of data, but the volume of data which is now accessible to us as researchers has transformed uh, dramatically. We look at the advent of a simple chip that's less than the size of a quarter called the three-axis accelerometer 
that is now embedded in a number of these commercial devices that you can buy in any store for less than $100. And it will tell you everything from your sleep to the amount of steps that you've taken and calories that you've burned over the course of uh, the day. Our colleagues here at the school, uh, part of the 105 projects I mentioned earlier, this is uh, Larry Cheskin in the School of Medicine, has just completed a randomized control trial looking at tailored text messaging as a way of enhancing uh, weight management support in populations here in East Baltimore. And they've shown substantial uh, improvements associated with these kinds of text messages. I think if I got this message, I might be a little bit irked, but uh, you know, my wife jokes that when I bought that uh, accelerometer, my weight actually went up by 10 pounds. So I may not be the model uh, citizen. So there are companies that are enhancing our ability to not just track food consumption and caloric intake, but also enhance this with the ability to scan our environment, to scan the bottle of Rice Krispies and know how many uh, calories that, that particular uh, ingredient contains, but also supplementing that with real-time monitoring of activity and then engaging the social network, which we are now all a part of. Your friends and family can keep track of how you're doing and encourage you through that process of weight management. Some of you may have seen this device I've been carrying around yesterday, which allows you on your iPhone to conduct a two-lead EKG that is now FDA approved, a really transformative technology that potentially we'll see us in the future even doing things like this, where this is a technology being developed at, uh, at uh, Tufts, where researchers are working on image analysis where you'll be able to take a po picture of a plate and recognize the composition and dietary content of that plate uh, in hopefully not too distant uh, future. There's a company called Aero that's apparently developed a wristband that has a built-in spectrometer that hopefully will be able to measure caloric intake as you are actually eating. So I have to see this to believe it, but this is the company's claim. But this is also a reality where we're able to do flow cytometry on a phone. We're able to do nuclear magnetic resonance on a phone. And I'll tell you, we're within three to five years of seeing these products being available to researchers in the room. So M Nutrition, we're looking at faster access to digital data. We're looking at improvements in adherence monitoring and promotion. We're looking at ways of engaging participants in the research that we do and enhancing the ability for us as, as intervention scientists to counsel and remind patients who are enrolled in nutritional intervention programs. But I think this scope of real-time activity and biomonitoring is another frontier that we should consider where we can also leverage social groups as part of the way we manage diet and, and uh, healthcare in these communities. And maybe we're looking at a future where we have point of care M proteomics on our uh, mobile phones. So sometimes I feel like this gentleman at the Colbert Rally for Change, you know, he's saying, what do we want? Evidence-based change. When do we want it? After peer review. And it's a rapidly changing environment, but I think it's important that we have uh, groups like uh, the Hopkins M Health Initiative that are really pushing that frontier of doing the rigorous research that's published and uh, subject to the methodologies that really determine the efficacy of these uh, strategies and technologies. We published a, a paper last year that, that really posed this question that is there more hype or hope on the horizon and we found that there were 215 M Health clinical trials in the grist mill. So I post it that there, there is hope on the horizon and we will see more robust, uh, rigorous research coming forward. And, and here's sort of a digest of some of the evidence that we have right now. We know that M Health for smoking cessation is very effective. We know it improves patient adherence to drug regimens and vaccine schedule adherence. And for stockouts for anti-malarials in Africa, it's been exceptionally uh, efficacious. So the world is changing, it's becoming more and more connected, and with this reality, I hope that uh, I've been able to pith your brains and make it a pithy uh, comment for uh, mobile technologies in the research that we're doing. Thanks so much. Well, um, thank you, Alan. That, that I'm sure imploded everyone. Uh, and you ran away so fast that I couldn't even say, are there any questions? So uh, we won't take any right now. Uh, and we'll go through this last 10 minute, uh, uh, I don't know, Whitman sampler on, on nutrition. Uh, 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 and then we'll open up for our dialogue. I, I, um, 
let's see, where's my, am I supposed to do this? There's a phone here, yeah. Siri, where are my slides? I couldn't stand having the rat in front of Bob during his, during his talk. You know? I, now I can put the rat back up. He's not jumping so well these days. He's 100 years old. You know? So, um, so I'm, we're going to switch a little bit here uh, toward um, some work, that's just to very quickly share with you work that we're uh, doing on the plasma proteome, mining it, exploring it. Uh, as a way to assess micronutrient deficiencies at a population level uh, and to reveal uh, hidden hunger, uh, it is it is uh, you know it's very much in the in the in the formative stages. Uh, this is a very complex area of our science. Uh, our biology is extremely complex, but we're trying to bring it bring that complexity to some simplicity in terms of potential use. When we look for micronutrient deficiencies, uh, you know some of the some of the talks that we've heard today, uh, 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 there are there there can be expected to be many micronutrient deficiencies in undernourished populations co coexisting. This is an example from uh, one of our populations in Nepal, and um, uh, the there's two messages here. This is these are pregnant women in in Sarlai, the population that uh, Dr. Christian uh, uh, described, and. One, one message is the more you look, the more you find. So the more you measure, the more you'll, you'll find deficiencies. And the second message is that they're not all at the same level. They're different. Uh, and, and so we need to be thinking about how to better assess populations in real time to make evidence-based decisions for public health programs that um, can address uh, their needs. Right now, existing micronutrient analyses require high-tech expensive and slow and very um, uh, uh, sensitive uh, instrumentation. Uh, I see Dr. Bob Cole in our proteomics mass spec laboratory across the street here, and uh, you know he has to pet his mass specs every day, uh, polish them and and take care of them. Or if he looks at them crooked. Uh, they will uh, shut down on them. So uh, we have we have HPLCs, we have immunoassays, we have uh, atomic absorption spectrophotometry. We have many different assays for many different nutrients, and um, and you know those are our gold standards. But they are slow, and they are expensive, and they are not performed in Rangpur, Bangladesh, or Lusaka, Zambia. They're performed in Baltimore uh, or a similar uh, you know well equipped area. We need to find a cheap way uh, to get this problem defined more quickly. They remain hidden. These deficiencies remain as hidden today as when that term micro, uh, hidden hunger was recoined in 1991. So what we need are methods to assess deficiencies precisely, that is, with a sufficient sample size that, uh, that can uh, deliver uh, 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 reliable estimates efficiently, multiple nutrients at the same time, cheaply to assess large samples repeatedly over time so we can monitor, accurately against whatever existing gold standards we want to put it up to, locally, that is in the affected countries, easily requiring minimal technical skills and readily in weeks rather than years. Uh, and this way we can detect, monitor, change and, and build programs. Preferably this would be on a single platform None of this exists. No matter what Dr. Labrique says, this, we're not there yet. Uh, but we may not be terribly far. Um, we approached the, the, the Gates Foundation several years ago, uh, and uh, they, they thought uh, uh, that it was sufficiently risky uh, to uh, uh, provide us with a grant uh, to explore the plasma proteome as a potential way of, uh, of assessing micronutrient status with an axiom being that um, uh, uh, all nutrients, as soon as they hit the mouth, are associated with a proteome from uh, uh, digestion, absorption, transport, 
storage, utilization, excretion, until they reach their metabolic fate, there is a proteome. We don't know what that is, but there's a proteome that, uh, that accompanies that, that, uh, that, that transition. Uh, and the, the, the assumption is that we can uh, uh, measure some aspect of that proteome in its relationship to micronutrients in plasma. And so we set out in, six, in 500 children in, in the NIPS-3 cohort to assess micronutrient status and inflammation status by conventional means, uh, measure the relative abundance of the plasma proteome by tandem mass spec and bioinformatics and high density statistics, uh, and identify a plasma neutroproteome, that is the proteins that are uh, measured in relative abundance uh, that correlate with micronutrient status measured by the gold standard, by our convention, uh, and to push it further to see if we could identify models uh, uh, whereby proteins could predict multiple micronutrient status at a population level. Uh, this is the one slide on the proteomics. We measure the micronutrient status of the, of the uh, 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 in the plasma by our traditional indicators. Uh, we have about 23 analytes. We uh, reduce the uh, plasma of highly abundant proteins, albumin, haptoglobulin, IgG, IgA, antitrypsin, transferrin, proteins that, that are so large they, they basically cover up the low abundance, hundreds to thousands of low abundance proteins that you could otherwise measure. Uh, we then look for these low abundance proteins by a very complex uh, mass spectrometry system uh, and look for differential expression of the proteins and relate those abundance levels to the nutrient levels that we measure by our conventional assays. We have a few papers that are out on this technique right now, uh, one that just came out uh, in October describing what we have found, looking at first at proof of concept. So we've, in this first paper, we've looked at five micronutrient protein dyads, that is, proteins that show, uh, that are inextricably in connected to nutrients, vitamin E with a key apolipoprotein that comes out of the liver into circulation, vitamin A with retinol binding protein, vitamin D with its binding protein, selenium with its major uh, transport protein, and copper with cellular plasma, to, to see if we could uh, identify uh, a clear relationship that would be sufficient to predict in the future. Um, and we were delighted to see with retinol binding protein uh, how it is related when, when RBP is measured by this mass spec process of fractionation and re reassembling the data to find the proteins based on peptide sequences. To see RBP come up uh, with a strong uh, association, strong correlation with, um, uh, uh, with serum retinol, here's the serum retinol level distribution. Uh, and these are the, this is an estimate of relative abundance uh, of, the, of the RBP using a, uh, uh, a linear mixed effects model that re removes some annoying variation that comes with the technique. Uh, so you can just see this, uh, this is a continuous spectrum of relative abundance. Uh, and, but the, the thing to look at is that we've got an R square of, of 0.77. That is, that RBP measured this way explains 77% of the variation in plasma retinol in this population of 500 children. This thrilled us uh, and uh, propelled us forward. Uh, it's not just RBP, though. I'll give you a hint. Uh, for those of you who love to work on vitamin A, what would your next protein that you would expect to be most strongly related to, to plasma vitamin A be? Right, transthyretin, because it, it travels in the blood at the, in the same, uh, same uh, complex uh, with uh, RBP. And that is what we found. Here's transthyretin. These are proteins that are associated with plasma retinol uh, with a p-value, this is just a short list uh, uh, at this small level, and a Q, a Q being the probability of it being a false positive, being quite small, less than 1%. So these are almost assuredly proteins that are associated with plasma retinol in uh, circulation. Uh, and um, uh, they range from apolipo, the carrier proteins to apolipoproteins to negative relationships with you know, complement factors that are known to be uh, involved in fighting infection uh, to various coagulation factors. It's sort of reflecting our biology as it relates to vitamin A through the proteome. 
Uh, and if one goes further, uh, uh, this is the false discovery rate of 0.01. I'm not going to ask you to read these, but these are all proteins that are positively associated with vitamin A. Vitamin A is up here. Uh, and negatively associated with vitamin A, and therefore positively associated with each other uh, or negatively associated with those proteins. So it's a correlation matrix that shows the variability and the extensiveness of the proteome that is associated with plasma retinol. And, oh, I did that same thing that you, Harry did, I think. Uh, what are those? Well, these are, the, these are the gene symbols, but these are all apolipoproteins that are involved in lipid transport. Vitamin A is known to, to be a, a fat-soluble vitamin. It, it's involved in lipid metabolism. It's carried by lipocalins, by lipid-carrying proteins. Uh, so it, it makes a lot of sense, not just the RBP or the transthyretin, but many of these other molecules we never think about in association with vitamin A or they may be involved with growth. In, um, uh, Insulin-like growth factor binding proteins and related molecules positively associated with um, plasma retinol. Uh, negative associations with wound healing, uh, 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 with, well, with the von Willebrand factor. Uh, host defense molecules, all negatively related to serum retinol. We know that serum retinol goes down uh, in, in inflammation. And so this is a confirmation of that kind of a relationship that we're seeing in the proteome that we can um, uh, uh, see through this mass spec process. Um, another example is vitamin E, plasma alpha tocopherol. Uh, we chose, it doesn't have a single protein that it carry, it's carried in the blood with. So uh, we chose APOC because it's, a, it's an important early lipoprotein that vitamin E is released with uh, into circulation from the liver. Uh, and we have Dr. Mara Traber here from Oregon State University who we're delighted to see, uh, who is the world's expert in vitamin E. So I, I talk about vitamin E with a lot of humility here, uh, uh, and happy to have you here. Um, here is the, here's the correlate, the R square with uh, plasma, uh, uh, between plasma vitamin E and relative abundance of this uh, particular apolipoprotein. Again, the distribution of uh, alpha tocopherol here, and a fairly good uh, R square. Maybe not enough, not good enough to predict, but strong. <coughs> Uh, but here's the alpha tocopherone uh, in the plasma. Uh, and if you looked at these carefully, you would find more lipid transport proteins that vitamin E is intimately associated with. You would see a negative relationship with cell adhesion uh, 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 molecules, uh, all of which have a, most, a story to tell with respect to vitamin E, or a negative relationship with uh, uh, host defense molecules, uh, 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 alpha-1 acid glycoprotein, or uh, uh, other uh, related molecules. So uh, just a few more examples. This is selenium with the uh, main uh, plasma carrying protein, uh, selenoprotein P1, a good strong correlation between the uh, uh, mass spec based relative abundance and the plasma selenium level. Here's vitamin D uh, with uh, vitamin D binding protein, uh, its carrier. Uh, less strong, but still a very, uh, a, you know, a good R square. That's a, uh, a correlation coefficient above 0.5, telling us that it's probably not good enough for, predict for prediction, but it's a step forward toward that. Uh, so we've, we've been looking at all the nutrients, and this is just a summary uh, where we, uh, of the fat-soluble nutrient plasma proteome right now, A, D, E's, and K that we have found so far. These are the numbers of proteins that we have found that have a probability of being false of less than 10%. Uh, and we've begun to identify potential predictors and have an initial model uh, where, for example, four proteins will explain, uh, right now our estimate is around 83% of plasma vitamin A, uh, or eight proteins, 73% of plasma vitamin E. But we're, we're not hitting the mark on these other vitamins right now, and there's a lot to talk about in terms of why that may be. Uh, there are people here interested in carotenoids. Uh, they are generally turning out not to be strongly related with, uh, with plasma proteins, except for beta-cryptoxanthine, where we've identified 52 proteins, and we're working with an R-square of 0.51. Um, Water-soluble vitamins and trace elements 
uh, we've been able to look at some of these. We, we, we're not exhaustive in the conventional assays that we've been able to do so far. Uh, folate, surprisingly, has no proteome uh, in the plasma associated with this level of strength, with that level of confidence. Whereas B6 has 88 proteins and an R-square of 0.58, B12 is striking out so far at this level of resolution, whereas uh, uh, copper is going through the roof in terms of the number of proteins that are strongly associated with it. Selenium only has three, but those who are working at selenium could probably predict what they are. It's the, the CEP1 protein, the glutathione peroxidase uh, three, and there's one other one. Uh, and then there are, it goes beyond the micronutrients. This is the lipid and acute phase response plasma proteome. So we've got uh, high density lipoproteins and low density lipoproteins measured uh, in this plasma. And we're identifying 62 and 15 proteins uh, respectively. Uh, and for the HDL, we've got an R square of 0.68. Uh, for the uh, acute phase reactants of uh, AGP and CRP, hundreds of proteins and very strong um, uh, associated R squares with six proteins and three proteins only uh, in the model. So uh, what you see is, it depends on the eyes of the beholder, uh, and uh, one sees a, you know, a, a, a 2D gel on the left side, but you can also see artwork in all of this. And so uh, we're calling it the plasma awesome. <laughs> Uh, as a way of, of taking chances, of exploring our biology, of seeing how we can relate nutrient status at a measurable, eventually simple level that could be put onto one of Dr. Labrique's uh, iPhones, obviously not mine, uh, but at a, at, a, at, a, at a platform in the future where we will be able to, at least at a population level, be able to say deficient, not deficient, if deficient, do something. Do something now because we've done it cheaply, we can do it repeatedly, and we can lift this veil of hidden off of this form of hunger. Thank you.